Good evening, everyone. Uh, last week we started this topic, which was really looking at Caritas and Veritati and what it had to tell us about how people would get along. This week, what I want to do is take this a bit further, ask the question, or I hope answer the question, or provide an argument to go to the heart of what is the organising principle behind society. Now we take society for granted, by and large, but what I want to do is look at what the Pope is proposing and what the world lives. Okay? And we want to look at, and I'm not going to go too much into social theories, but essentially I'm going to be presenting a social theory, or at least critiquing the way that society works. And so this is going to be getting away mainly from the economics and all that sort of stuff, and it's going to be looking at something else. How does society work and what are we kind of aiming for in all of our social relations? And once we get this under control, then we can understand, or at least start to ask the question about economic relations, because economic relations are only part of our whole social experience. So that's the question that we're going to be looking at. In uh, Caritas in Veritati, what the Pope suggests is that everything has its origin in God's love. Everything is shaped by it, everything is directed towards it. Now, we were talking just before we started about the way that love sometimes can be this fuzzy thing which everyone wants and everyone believes they're doing and really it it's sort of can be a bit wishy-washy and uh, a bit meaningless. I think what the Pope is talking about is God's love. And so we need to plumb into the question of what God's love means and how that filters through into society and if it's at all relevant. Now in a sense this is starting to take us right to the face of the difference between the Christian perspective on society and any other perspective on society. Because the Christian has a, what I'm going to look at or suggest later on, is a metaphysical foundation to their understanding of creation, which is going to lead to conclusions about the way we act as humans. And that metaphysical statement you know, God exists, then becomes the foundation that everything else has to be built on. If you don't believe in God, that's fine, but behind that is the matter of whether God exists or not. It's a bit like having a bit of trouble with petrol or something. I, I, might like, I may not like petrol. And so I might try and dream up an explanation for why my car works. It's not got anything to do with petrol because I don't believe in petrol. It goes, I go along to the service station. You know, when was the last time you actually saw petrol? Most of the time we just stick the little hose in the side, uh, and numbers go around. There could be all sorts of things happening there. Yeah? If I don't want to believe in it, in a sense I could even invent my whole theory of physics and mechanics and whatever else <coughs> it needs to make a motor car based on the way that I've never seen petrol, or at least not recently. Now, you might sort of sit back and say, well, that's a bit loony. Well, that's about as loony as saying, I'm going to have a social theory without God because I don't want to believe in God, and God is actually there. So all we want to do is explore those implications a little bit. And the Pope, well, he's, you know, his uh, team is, is all about accepting the existence of God. We can spend a bit of time going through proofs for the existence of God, but I, I suspect that Either you've done that before and you accept them, or you don't want to know about them, and so there's not a lot of my point in me going through them tonight, so I'm not going to. But what I am going to do is make that as a, a starting point. Either you believe in God or you don't. If you want to go over proofs of the existence of God, we can do that another time. If God exists, though, we can accept this nature, and later on we're going to talk about why the existence of God leads to the existence or the necessity of love. But then we're going to come down and look at Saint um, Bonaventure. Now I mentioned him last week and from time to time he pops up when I'm talking about things. And his whole way of understanding the world, theology and philosophy, I think can be best understood with this focus on love. And I really liked this notion. If one does not love one's neighbour, it is not easy 
to do him justice. Now it goes back to you know, that hundred years ago he was saying this. And it makes us appreciate that while we might talk about people's rights and justice being necessity and using democracy to get justice and all the rest of it, in a sense justice is this curious thing that we don't have to do it and a lot of people don't bother. One way or another we're going to see that what St Bonaventure was suggesting 800 years ago is really behind what the Pope is saying here and it comes out very clearly in Caritas, in Veritati, we read on. I'm suggesting that justice is a gift of love and it's civilising largely because it leads ultimately to moral behaviour and moral behaviour leads to predictability and trust in a community or a society and that leads to civilisation. Okay, so there's this kind of causal chain. In Caritas in Veritati, I'm continuing just to use the numbers here, so if you want to read the encyclical 34, you can find the Pope talking about gift and the importance of gift. I think I mentioned, it was either last week or the week before, about the distinction between the gift economy and the contract economy. Those two logics. Here, what the Pope is saying is this gift economy uh, comes back to the family model, and I've mentioned that before. But the Pope is saying it quite explicitly. Gift is what makes the economy, the society, in some way human and social. We find that as a echo of ideas that we first found in the social encyclicals, right back to the first one in Rerum Navarum, uh, back in 1891, where Pope Leo XIII was talking about giving of one's excess. Now that's got nothing to do with taking of one's excess, the way that the socialists would recommend. It's also got nothing to do with keeping it until market forces can't take it away from me, the way hardcore capitalism would say, well, property rights, you know, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. How dare you get something to come take it away, right? We're talking about freely giving away of one's excess. What that suggests is that justice is a gift. I'm saying giving justice is something that is a gift because in a sense treating somebody else justly is always an instance of when I have the power to do otherwise. You think about it, the police come along and book you for speeding or what have you. You know, there might be some questions about justice, right? The policemen have the power to do all sorts of things to you. They could make up the fine on the spot and they could take you away and put you in prison or book you for things that you never did. You know, hide, well, you know, say that you had drugs in the back of your car, whatever. In a sense, the fact that we assume that our policemen are going to give us justice is something that they don't have to do. It's just ha something that happens in a civilised community. And some of you have probably come across, you know, it's a good movie line. When you see policemen that have gone sour and you expect them to give justice and they don't. And it's the same for all of us. We walk down the street and, you know, don't mug somebody. We might have the power to, right? Certainly if you're just on the way home from CrossFit, you probably have the power to. But you're choosing not to, even though you have the power. So you're giving justice to the people around you. The Pope is onto this and it comes back from this notion of St. Bonaventure. Giving justice when one has the power to do otherwise. It leads on to a couple of technical terms that we might get onto later on, commutative and distributive justice, which are old ideas in Catholic social thought, especially to do with just prices, just wages. If we're going to be giving a gift, a gift must be free. And in a sense, the giving activity, action, is and not just a gift, but it's something that I do freely in order, in a sense, to complete myself. And most of you have had the experience of how pleasant it feels when you give someone a present. You know, you feel good. In fact, almost you might feel better than the person who takes a gift. And I guess it's one of the reasons why in receiving a gift, part of the way that you show love in receiving a gift is to enjoy it and show appreciation because in that way you're giving something to the giver. Later on we're going to look at that as receptive love. It's a way of showing love, of, of acting love, <coughs> through reception. 
And so this freedom is, is really important. You know, kids kind of have to give Aunt Flo a present and they really, you know, can't handle the perfume she wears or something. It, it, you know, you can't nudge them along. But at some point they have to break out of that because in a sense it's not really an act of love if it's done you know, through compulsion. Right? So, yeah, so freedom is really important. When we talk about the liberal arts and so on, we're talking about this notion of uh, a freedom which perfects you. And here, gift is, is very much the core of that. And we're going to come back into that a, uh, over and over again. The notion of freedom and the act of justice, the gift of justice, is both the source and the result of solidarity. Because giving justice, whether you decide not to mug somebody on the way home or what have you, in a sense, it's showing your oneness with them, even if you don't have any other relationship to them. While it might be really nice to do something positive for a, let's say, someone sitting on a street corner, a homeless person, and that's really good, in a sense, not beating them up is a gift. As much as putting money in their you know, tray is a gift. Right? You see the, the distinction there? While it's good to do something positive, the very fact that you don't do something horrible is in a sense a form of gift. So there's kind of levels of, of gift giving. I, I don't want to talk you out of, of active charity, but just to sort of point out that you know, in some places, homeless people are treated absolutely dreadfully. And I'm suggesting that it's a path to self-perfection, which is the object of true freedom, okay? freedom to be. So given this notion of gift, I think is really important. It's probably the major theme that I took out of Caritas in Veritati. And I think it's, it's important because we're going to be taking that back into the marketplace a bit later. Only in charity does truth shine forth. Now, this is an idea that uh, Pope Benedict is uh, very fond of. I think it's a delicate idea because you have to understand the meanings of the terms and use them fairly precisely. It's relatively easy to use this in a bit of a mixed up way, unfortunately, because we have to be very clear that we're talking about the Christian understanding of charity rather than, again, a wishy-washy form of love. So we can read it as, as, as Christians and see it. Yes, that, that makes sense, but you've got to be careful with it because if you change the meaning of charity to something a bit more wishy-washy, and especially at present with um, you know, the debates that are going around about, about love, then there's a very different truth that comes out of you know, not wanting to offend people because of their recreational pursuits. However, taken correctly, it's quite a useful and powerful concept that in charity does truth shine forth. In a sense, it gives you the, the freedom, if you're in an environment of charity, it's a time when you, in a sense, are more likely to be open to the truth. If you're very defensive, it's almost like a psychological thing, then it's often harder to be indifferent, uh, like to be open, to be disinterested enough to, to take on the notion of truth. And so it's, it's kind of, to me, it's a bit of a dangerous statement, but we'll, we'll take it in, in the positive term. The important thing about it is that truth leads to reason. It points towards notions of Living that gift of justice, what's justice? Justice linked with the idea of knowable ethics, knowable principles, knowable morals. And so this pursuit of what my principle should be is something that I can do using reason. Okay? It becomes objective. And this is an important issue and something which I think, unfortunately, is rapidly getting forgotten in our moral discourse today. And they were so busy being nice and politically correct and all the rest of it, the idea of grounding morals in objective thinking is largely getting lost, I think. And it's certainly not nearly as precise as it used to be. I'd like to see exceptions and that's fantastic. If you go back half a century or so, or maybe a century, the way the church thought was delightfully objective and clear and in a sense simple. And if you look at, uh, and again, my, one of my favourites, um, Edward Carl's book, Framework of Christian State, you read it and it's very, very simple. It covers everything from family relations to you know, the Russian Revolution. And it's a clear, crisp, fact, 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 conclusion, conclusion, conclusion. And you really know at the end of it 
what is a correct principle and what's not. It's not simply appealing to emotion or some psychological state or something like that. And really the master of this kind of thinking, I would say, would be St Thomas Aquinas, without a doubt. And it's one of the reasons why I think St Thomas is so important to be taught. It doesn't necessarily have to be the whole of your philosophical position, but if something doesn't conform to St Thomas, then often it's only accidental whether you end up with a reliable conclusion or not, I would say. In particular, we're going to be looking at a handful of questions in the second part of the second part of the summer. Question 66, 77, 78, 117. Second part of the second part is pretty easy to remember. 66 and 77 is pretty easy to remember. So you can go home in your own time, maybe download those questions from the new Advent site where you can get onto the, onto the summer and read them through. We'll be going through those in a fair bit of detail later on. They're delightfully crisp and objective but we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves because we want to complete our understanding of why that approach is valid. We haven't got there yet. One of the things which has disappeared out of our world is the study of metaphysics. Even worse is the study of bad metaphysics. Because now if you go to most universities, and certainly my experience uh, at secular university doing philosophy, for the first year or so that I was studying metaphysics, I found that this horrible hodgepodge of things that just never really made any sense and you learn certain things in order to follow the exam and I thought, oh my goodness, thank goodness that's over. Metaphysics is like that because of the modern movement in philosophy. Metaphysics is meant to be, is the grounding of all scientific reasoning. And I use science in a bigger sense than simply the natural sciences. So my theology, my mathematics, my morals, I would say, are all sciences. And we could show you how that works another time. Metaphysics is, is the, the grounding of them. It's understood, and certainly St Thomas is a master of this, is that metaphysics is the only science that proves its own premises. That's really important. Because every other science, if I'm doing physics or biology or something like that, I have to adopt premises, starting points, beginning statements, that come from other places. And so you end up with this kind of circular feeling, and a lot of modern philosophy is based on the idea, well, there's no starting point, so the whole thing's absurd, and you just kind of make it up as you go along. Sound metaphysics is able to prove its own starting point, so it really is the very foundation of all of our thinking. Every science has to have its metaphysics. However, and you would have read there on the overhead, that metaphysics has largely been taken out of the modern curriculum. And if it's taught, usually it's this modern metaphysics, which I think is a wonderful inoculation against metaphysics. Uh, it's just, you know, I'll go on about that because I, I have a bit of a passion for conventional metaphysics. Metaphysics is the study of what is fit to be. That's from St. Thomas. It's the first science and it's fundamental to all science. If you take metaphysics out of any study, you end up really not being able to prove anything. And I'd say that's very much the case with all of our modern social sciences economic sociology, anthropology, psychology. They don't have the metaphysics, or well, the metaphysics is all wishy-washy, uh, and as a result, they end up really just going around in circles, like a dog chasing its tail. And the Pope has sort of picked up on this. This task, the thinking needed to solve the world's problems, cannot be undertaken by the social sciences alone, largely because their metaphysics is, is basically absent. And we could go back to, well, one of my favourites is David Hume, to see how he scuttled metaphysics uh, in the modern mind. Insofar as the contribution of disciplines such as metaphysics and theology is needed, if man's transcendent dignity is to be properly understood. I think the Pope could even have gone a little kind of further there, is that while it is needed for man's transcendent dignity to be properly understood, you can also see the necessity of metaphysics to understand even his material dignity and his operations on a material level. However, the, the, the Pope is being a bit more cautious, which is probably wiser than me. So what's metaphysics? I mentioned that it was rejected by modernity. It explores the essence of existence and beautifully it admits of the existence of God. 
again something which is totally left out of the social sciences. And I think you guys, I know a couple of you have studied a bit of social science. One of the things which is curious about so social science, and again sort of sociology, psychology, economics, a handful of others, is that while they're very much about society, the one thing which doesn't exist in them is any concept of love. And I found that really sobering when I discovered it when I was studying so, uh, psychology and to a certain extent sociology as well. You end up with this very arid sense of, of society. And the Pope is suggesting that in that environment you simply can't solve the social question. What I want to do now is look at what really is and look at why that necessarily gives us a social theory, if you like, which is quite different to that very arid modern social science approach. I said we would begin with the assumption of the existence of God. There has to be some big thing out there which is outside of, of the material world and exists. Yeah, we'll, we'll accept that. The next question though is what is it like? Is it energy? Is it Allah? Is it some unknowable deity? Is it the great architect of the universe? What's it like? I'm going to use it, hopefully, some syllogistic reasoning here, maybe a little bit loosely done in order to keep it at least a little bit interesting to listen to. <clears throat> Love exists in the world. We can add to that the notion that if something exists in a product, in an effect, it must exist in the cause. In fact, it must exist in the cause more perfectly. You just try and think of anything that you've made which in some way doesn't reflect the greater perfection of the maker. It doesn't happen. You, know, you can't make something perhaps supernatural or something. You, know, you can't make a time machine or something because we don't have the capacity to understand how to master time. Right? Uh, there are probably a lot of other examples. Okay. So what, if you see something in the effect, you know it's going to exist more perfectly in the course. We can say that love exists in the world, and okay, we've got the fuzzy love and we've got the true love, and if only a little shred of true agape, Christian love exists in the world. If we can say, yes, you know, up on that mountaintop there is one person who lived 5,000 years ago and he lived, or she uh, lived, this pure Christian love, what we can say is from that one instance, therefore it must exist in the Creator, so we're going to lead down to something about the Creator. So it's not simply energy or something like that, or some impersonal creative force. Love exists in God. Furthermore, and it takes a little bit of, of argument, I won't do it tonight, but basically if you have some uncreated being which is capable of, its, of maintaining itself, everything, every quality that it has must be infinite. Because being the source of its own be, its own existence, what it has, it has without limit because it is its own be, its own existence. So whatever you, whatever quality it has, it has infinitely. The other curious thing about it is that whatever it has, it has in action, not potentially. I'm potentially a great athlete. Dustin has got sort of great confidence in my ability to be a great athlete, right? But I'm not a great athlete. But I have the potency. Yeah. Now, in a sense, that's a defect. Well, Justin would certainly be very conscious of the fact that it's a defect, right? Because he'd prefer me to be really acting it out. Yeah. In God, whatever exists, not only will it be infinite, but it won't be a potential. It will be in act. It will be actual. Because there would only be a potency. Uh, there are a couple of problems with that. First of all, it, it means that God isn't perfect. He has to get there. Wh whatever is in God has to, has to be acting, not uh, potential. Because he, he, he doesn't have any defect. And again, it comes back to the idea of his being his own cause. What does that mean? It actually presents a problem for the existence of God. Because if we're thinking about what love is, can you love without having something to love? 
Because if you think about that, you know, I'm a loving person. Well, what I'm talking about is, yes, that might be the way I am, but in a sense it's only love in potency. I'm waiting for something to love. You know? To be loving in act, to be actually loving in the present or in eternity, which is even better than the present, like the eternal present, what it means is there must be an object for that love. That tells us something about God. In a sense, God could not be God without having an other to love. And that object of God's love would have to be capable of receiving the infinite love of God. Because if it only capable of receiving half of it, in a sense, God could only be actually loving with half of his strength. And so, not only does God love infinitely, perfectly, and in act, but that immediately tells us that there must be half an other, a, a, an object of that love, which is infinite, capable of receiving that love infinitely. It must be actual, it must really be existing, it's not just an idea that's going to pop into existence at some point in the future. Yeah. Where does that take us? It takes us into the idea of perhaps another god. Right. Now there's a problem there because if you have two gods, and again I don't really want to spend too much time on, on this, but if you have two gods in a sense they would have to be totally disconnected. Uh, there would be no necessary link between them because both of them are totally self-sufficient and complete in themselves. Right? St Thomas gives us an explanation for the existence of the second person of the Blessed Trinity, which is the Word, the Word being, if you like, the understanding of God, the wisdom of God. Very early in the sermon, I couldn't tell you the, the, uh, the, the question, but it's worth having a look at. It works like this. In a sense, everything that exists existed first as an idea, and through human agency, for human um, effectiveness, or maybe natural agency, that idea became a reality. Right? That, that cup sitting on the table. Somebody had to think that it would be nice to make a cup just that shape with that design on it before they could actually make that cup. And in a sense, it was the idea of the cup that gave rise or was a cause of the cup. Ideas have the ability to cause things. We can see that in the material world. Yeah. For God, what does he do in the act of creation? You know, I've loved you for all eternity. God is there having an idea of creation in mind. And what did God do? He had to go out and sort of go down to Bunnings and get some raw materials and sort of, you know, patch some things together to make the world? No. What do you do? He just thought about it, didn't he? His thinking had the, the, the power, because God's thoughts are, are, are pretty big, to cause all of our creation. Now, if God can do that at the level of creation, because God understands or God has an idea of all of creation, what happens when God thinks about what God is? This is a little bit tricky because we have to kind of get out of time a little bit. Okay, but just imagine the very first instance. Uh, if you can imagine going back to the beginning of eternity. Yeah, but okay, we'll just put it in time for a moment. God's first thought. He said, yeah, that's nice. Guess what? I'm God. Now, remember, what God has is infinite and perfect and in act. And so his thought about himself is infinite, actual, and all the rest of it. And when he thinks about himself, the potency of that thought doesn't create, but it is equal to the idea of what it is. And so the, for God, the idea of God, the idea of himself, is infinitely potent. God's idea 
is, in a sense, as powerful as he is himself. has to be. It's a little tiny bit tricky. I'll just leave you to think about that in your own time. Okay. But the neat thing about it, and I'll just kind of fast forward a little bit, is that in that sense, that potency of God in his thought begets himself in a sense, but in another sense. And we call that other sense the word, the Logos, second person of the Blessed Trinity. And why so much when we look at scripture, we equate the notion of wisdom with the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Uh, why St. John, the evangelist, referred to our Lord, the Logos, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, as the Word. The Word for God, like what does a Word mean for God? Well, he, it, it's really his thought. We call it the Logos, if you sense the logic of God, the, his idea. Now, the curious thing about God is that when he thinks, it's a little bit boring, but he only has one thought. But that thought is as big as everything that can be. That one thought, simultaneously and in all places, has everything that can be understood, including himself. And that thought has the potency of God. Very much the second person of the Blessed Trinity, we call Jesus, okay, or the Logos, has this special part to play, if you like, in that Trinity, which is um, the wisdom, the form, the design, if you like, of all of creation. And it's through the form, the word, that creation exists. Okay. That's from St. Thomas, perhaps paraphrasing, probably not doing as nearly as tidy a job as St. Thomas would. From that idea, a metaphysical idea, or perhaps really the ontology, the, uh, the, the, the notion of being, of what God's thought is, we have this second person. This second, not a second God, but God again, within himself, and, and indistinguishable from himself. Yep. But, how big is he? As big as God. How eternal is he? As eternal as God. Okay. And it's that second person of the Blessed Trinity which is the object, the primary object, of God's love. God's thinking, God the, God the Father's thinking, is infinite, it's outgoing, it's creative. We've gone as far as seeing that his thought is so big and so potent, and when he thinks about himself, he's actually begetting something with all of the characteristics of himself, in fact really himself, and so it's both himself and not, and okay, we're kind of getting into the mystery of the Trinity a little bit. You can see how big and powerful this is. No. But he loves it into existence. And he loves it in a creative way. And in fact, we talk about God the Father as the creator. And so his creative potency begins with that first thought, which is the thought of himself, which we call the Word. He came down to earth as the Son of God. Now, what's the relationship between creative God, the Father, the first person of the Trinity, and the love experienced by the Son, the Logos, the second person of the Blessed Trinity? Yeah. Well, the second person of the Blessed Trinity has received all from the Father. In a sense, it's that first thought of God that is the begetting of God the Son. Yeah. Did God the Son give it? No, he received it. And just a moment ago, we were talking about the way that Receiving a gift can show and be as much of an act of love as giving. You know? We're sort of talking about Christmas presents and honey flow and all that stuff, right? So how does the Logos express love? How does he live love? How does he act it? He acts it through being infinitely receptive. Now I invite you to go out into the Gospels again and just read through the relationship, especially in St. John's Gospel, but in the others as well. Look at the relationship between the Father and the Son, the Creator and the Logos. And you find so many places where he is talking, uh, where the, the Gospel writers are describing the way 
and instances where Jesus is praying, where this receptive love is praying to the creative love and talking about everything that I have you've given me and he's going to give it back. It's this sort of interplay of love between the Father and the Son. Absolutely lovely. All in terms of receptive love. Everything that you know he had came from the Father. And he's received it, but he's received it in the way that you would receive a gift at Christmas. By giving love simply by showing your appreciation. And you live that right down to the core of your being. Now, that's not where it finishes. Because that receptive love and that creative love, that lovely interplay between the Father and the Son, while we're talking about the thinking of God being so potent that it creates and its most marvellous, well, it's not a creation, it's, it's, it's something else, is, is the Son, the Logos. Also, one of the things we know on earth is that true love is fecund, it's productive. True love always produces more in some way. Yeah? And when you receive the Christmas gift, in a sense there's something more. There's a bond of friendship which is deepened, or a bond of love which is deepened. And in marriage we have families. We have this fecundity, which is a lovely example of the way that love works. Love is not static. It's not sterile. Which again, sort of comes back to the debates that are rattling around the place at present. A sterile love is not love at all. It can't be. And so what do we have? We have the product of love, the thought of the Father created the Son, begot the Son. But the interplay of love between the Father and the Son is generative, it is productive, it goes out, it's even bigger than those two. And that product, that product of love, especially in St. Bonaventure, is understood to be the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Blessed Trinity. Again, the perfect fecundity infinite, as God is infinite. Complete. It's a complete reproduction of the Godhead. And so everything which is in the Father is in the Son. Everything is in the Father and the Son is in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is everything which is in the Father or the Son, or both. Right? They kind of all basically are sort of so interlayered and exchangeable almost, interpenetrated. They're indistinguishable. When we think about the Trinity, we don't think about three gods. We think about one God with three persons. And the real distinction in them is not so much in what they are, but what they do. It's their actions as persons which distinguish them. God as the, 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 the creator as the creator, the, the logos as the word, and the, uh, the spirit as... Um, you know, this generative love. And so we find the Trinity there. Now, in the first presentation, we looked at the way that that uh, comes down to earth in some ways. But what we have here is the prototype for society. Now, here we have not a contract relationship. We have an absolute love relationship, one which is purely in terms of gift. It is not in, in any way in terms of expectation or contract or uh, demands. It's all in terms of giving away. One of the curious things about the theology this takes you to is that God the Father uh, is omnipotent, but he is infinitely giving himself away, actually giving himself away infinitely all the time. If you give away, let's say, all your money, how much do you end up left? None at all. Okay, isn't that curious? Right? And if you give away all of your energy, or all of your clothing, or all of your, anything else that you had, you'd end up with nothing, wouldn't you? How much does God give away? Well, does he sort of hold anything back? No. In one sense, God the Father is infinitely poor. Because he's the infinite giver. If I put money on the plate on Sunday... You know, I keep a little bit more for later on. God doesn't do that. What he gives away is total. And so in a sense, uh, this is a Franciscan stuff kind of coming out again, I guess, is that the, the Franciscan 
tradition is to really see God the Father as the you know the model that St Francis took to see St Francis was pretty big on poverty and so what we're doing we're, we're copying the Father who's infinitely poor but in being infinitely poor what happens he gets it all back in a sense in the receptive love of the, of the Son and of course he's never exhausted either so that's quite delightful and the Holy Ghost as generative love brings love to the world and that's why not only is the Holy Ghost the, the soul of the church, in a sense all love and all of existence owes its existence to the Holy Ghost as love on earth as a dynamic. Okay. What I want to do is bring that down now to what that means for something as boring as when you go to work tomorrow. Okay. And I'm going to go through this hierarchy I really want to start at the top here. Karl Marx, when he looked at the world, he didn't believe that there was anything that you couldn't see. And so that meant that he interpreted the whole of the world in terms of material transactions. If you have material transactions, they must be economic, because economics is about our patterns of exchange, how people exchange stuff in order to get what they need to keep alive. Now, if you don't have anything apart from matter, ultimately you can say that all of our relationships are economic. So I'm not talking economics in terms of you know, supply and demand graphs and all that kind of boring stuff. I'm using economics here in a slightly different sense. It's got to do with material exchanges. So I'm going to start at this very mundane, secular kind of level. We're going to see where that comes from. When we look at economic action, in other words exchanging stuff in the marketplace or when I go to work tomorrow, I find that economic action doesn't have its own complete logic. Remember I said that before all the sciences rely on borrowing stuff from other places? Well economics, even just yeah, just day-to-day -day economics, relies on, on a number of things. For instance it relies especially on property rights and on uh, expectations regarding contracts, they're the two most important ones, there are a few others as well, if we look at those two. So I can't sell you something that I don't own, you can't pay me if the money is not yours, right? we have to have property rights, and the basis of economic action is exchange, and so we have to have some rules for that exchange, which is our contracts. Right? So if we own stuff, we have to have contracts. Where do we get the idea of ownership from? We get it from our idea of property title. I could put contracts in here as well. One of the few places that liberal capitalists would say there is a role for government is that they admit that we need government to ensure the institution of private property and contract law. So even though you get rid of government for everything else, which would be kind of lovely because you wouldn't need an army perhaps, stuff like that, and all those environmentalists getting around sort of a government sort of salaries, but whatever it is, we need property rights, property titles enshrined by institutions held up by the government, and we need contracts. Again, it's something which is artificial, it's convention, property rights. We might say that there's an element of, of nature, like natural aspect to property rights, we're going to be getting that in another, another talk, but fundamentally, the way that we're going to do property, like if you go and buy a house, You've got to do a whole lot of government kind of things. Right? You've got to tell the government, you've got certificates of title, you've got a whole legal process involved in conveyancing. And it's the same when it comes down to selling, buying some cars, and even little things. And, you know, if, if you go up to Woolies and, and buy something you don't like it, you've got a certain amount of legal you know, recourse, and that's because there are all these laws in place to govern the way that we do contracts. Yeah? So our property titles and contracts sit on a legal governmental system. And so contract, the institution of contracts doesn't sit on itself, it relies on laws and the way the government works, the way the government decides things in order to operate. Where do we get our legal and governmental system? We can see it in a democracy because one way or another we get to vote who we think is going to do the right thing. What that says is that our government exists on the back of the community's expectations of what the right thing is. I'm going to call that culture and ethics. 
because what it means is that the government is going to make sure that I don't think, do things which are either immoral, according to my beliefs, or the majority of the Australians, and to a certain extent also, you know, there's a certain amount of cultural sensitivity in the way that we make laws. Right? So what we're saying there is that our government system doesn't sit in its own little world, it actually sits on the culture and ethics of the society. Again, the culture and ethics, where do they come from? You're probably getting a bit sure of where I'm going with this. I'm going to suggest that our culture can be understood as sitting on our understanding of what it is to be human. So if I and me, my tribe believe that we were the humans and you guys or somebody else was okay to eat, you know, we talked about cannibalism a couple of weeks ago, that would give me a different culture which would then produce a different form of government which produced different kinds of economic relationships. So, our culture, to a certain extent, is based, well, in fact, on a large extent, that the more you drill into it, the more you discover that our whole idea of appropriate relations between persons has to do with what my understanding of you as a person is, dehumanising the vulnerable, and those kind of ideas. So we can see where dreadful things have happened because a group has taken on an ethic which is based on a very bad understanding of what humanity is about. And again, cannibalism is my favourite example of that. So, culture and ethics is based on anthropology. And so anthropology is your understanding, your theory of what it is to be human. And where do you get that from? Well, you've got the answer up there. It comes from our theory of where everything comes from. I'm going to call that our metaphysics, in the, metaphys in the other sense of the word metaphysics. You know, metaphysics as in spooky stuff. More specifically, in our Genesis story, or our Genesis theory. And so if I have one Genesis story, that will give me a particular anthropology, will give me a particular culture, will give me a particular, you know, law and, and all that sort of stuff. And up it goes. Okay, that's regardless of what culture you have, what, what society you have. Let's look at that in action, a couple of examples of this now. We'll put that together and we'll say, what is the Pope talking about? What is the Pope suggesting as the organising principle for society? Well, in the previous slides, I was talking about generative love and receptive love and all that. My metaphysics here, my Genesis story, is God made the world. And if it's the most Blessed Trinity is the source of creation, and we are made in his image, all people have equal dignity. It means that there is this gift relationship which models the social relations which are in the Trinity, which is give and it will be given back to you. The idea of the omnipotent Father giving away all, certainly with the kind of understanding, the awareness, that that all comes back. It means that our metaphor, our model for society, is the family. The family is the model of the Trinity. And it's all based on the idea of gift. And that will then come up to an understanding of the community, all of our economic relationships, as being the individual can have the confidence to know that they're going to be cared for materially, economically if you like, as a result of the contribution to the community. Okay, so the, the, the focus then is this communal focus, or it's really a solidaristic focus. Let's contrast that to the alternative metaphysics, the alternative Genesis story. The Genesis story that we're surrounded with at present is that matter came into existence as a result of the chance collusion of particles and so you had the big bang and you had little particles bumping into each other and clumping together and becoming molecules and stars and all that sort of character. So our Genesis story is, if you like, paraphrase or the metaphor for it is the chance bumping into of atoms. To a certain extent we see that all the way up the chain of, of complexity in existence and so you've got the idea of uh, evolution. Again, this chance bumping in to 
of the, of the organism versus the environment. Uh, if you're able to bump in and win, then you uh, survive as an organism. If you don't, you sort of disappear. So, so Darwin is kind of in there with this idea of the, the chance bumping in. If all of our relationships are kind of modelled on our original genesis of bumping into each other, and the one who gets the better deal as a result of the interaction wins, then you end up with an anthropology of ultimately humans, but in fact everything in existence as being no more than self-interested individuals. In our case, for humans, self-interested rational individuals. And so dogs and cats, bugs, whatever they are, they're only in it for what they can get out of themselves. And to a certain extent that might work if you're talking about mosquitoes and whatnot. But when it gets to humans, uh, made an image of likeness of God, you're missing out somewhere. The ethic that comes from that. I'm calling it pleasure maximisation. You find that in utilitarianism. You find it in a number of modern systems of ethics. And it's the idea that one way or another the only good that exists is pleasure. And you might be able to define pleasure fairly subtly to include things like watching a sunset perhaps. But one way or another it all comes down to material pleasures. Okay. Liberalist in that I want to be an atom bumping in to and sort of getting the best deal out of all my bumps. If you constrain me, then that goes right against my very nature. What am I? I'm a bumping thing. I'm an independent bumping thing. I've got no relationships, no obligations to anybody. If I hang out with somebody, it's simply because I've bumped and decided to stick together for a while. And so one of your greatest goods, certainly high up the, 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 uh, the chain of uh, desirable attributes, is freedom, the freedom to, to bump in where you want to, come and go where you want to. Now curiously, what sort of a uh, culture does this give rise to? When I get to this next stage, some people think, oh yeah that's true, and then uh, they say, no, 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 it's absolutely wrong, uh, especially when I put up two possibilities. Because there are actually two options that can come from an anthropology of independent bumping in people. On the left we've got socialism, uh, which believes that everyone should be free to bump in as much as they can and sort of get the government to make sure that you know the big bumpers don't sort of give me a hard time. The, on the other side uh, we've got um, exactly the same processes and in fact exactly the same definition of the human person, but saying that we should have the freedom to be the bumper into, and the bigger I get sort of bumping in, that's a right that I've got because of the very nature of what it is to be that kind of a person. In economics, we use homo economicus, which is a rational, self-interested individual. And that is at the very core of our whole theory of market theory, which, if you like, is the economics of the right side, the, uh, the capitalist side. And so you end up coming up through here, again, state property, private property, eventually these both become centralist, especially when we see, and we sort of see it in uh, reality, what does the socialist do? He wants all of the property to be owned by one person, one entity, the, the state. What happens in capitalism? Well, if you're able to keep the free market at the stage where you've got lots and lots of small property owners, that's fine, that's true. Okay? But the practicality is that once you take God out of the picture, the free market becomes the real focus of, of capital and you end up with the very small number of extremely powerful organisations that tend to starve out everybody else. So you get the standard oils and, uh, and that sort of thing. And so the free market, and again we've talked about the, 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 the curiosity there, the free market not really being free, it's all about force, but the practical side of it is that you end up with a very small number of entities with all of the, or the great amount of the economic power. There's this theory here of community well-being through individual self-interest. Okay, well, you can see there are, while there appear to be two options here, what I would suggest is that we really have two different ways of looking at the world, looking at humanity, looking at society. It just happens that this one kind of splits into two versions. Yeah, I think I mentioned, I think on our first evening, that in Quadragesimo Anno, Pope uh, Pius XI, in section 46 of that encyclical, points this out very, very explicitly. 
the twin shipwrecks of faith, I think, he used a lot of expression very much like that. And then basically these twin shipwrecks, he, he takes it from uh, you know, the, the Greek myths, uh, that sort of two very, very dangerous things. If you go one way or the other, you've got to steer between them. Okay, how does that work in terms of organising society? Because I don't want to be limited merely looking at economics, although economics is, is useful because ultimately our social relationships can be interpreted with reasonably completely in, in material terms. You don't, you don't catch the, the love and so on, the real relationships, but you certainly catch what is observable externally. So economics is, is a good indicator, if you like, of deeper things. What I'm going to suggest is what I'm going to call dimensions for social action. And really this is a representation of that hierarchy that we had in the last couple of slides. And the way I'm going to set it up is that I would suggest that most Western people that you come across think in terms of two possibilities for social action, social organisation. If you talk to somebody, they tend to be kind of working out whether you're a lefty or a righty. Right? We'll see the two possibilities. And if you start talking about politics and economics, whoa, definitely you're going to be a lefty or a righty. Okay? And you've got someone who's hardcore on the left, and you sort of try talking about this Caritas and Veritati stuff, uh, they immediately think you're a right winger. And if you talk to a serious right winger about exactly the same things, because they're sort of coming from over there somewhere, they kind of see that you're actually a lefty. Right? Because there's only two possibilities. Now we saw that in the previous slide, that that's kind of over there in particular, anthropology. We've already explored a bit of this, so I won't spend too much time on it, but basically the institutional, what I'm calling the institutional dimension, gives you the expression for a particular anthropology of either left or right, communist or capitalist, that sort of thing. But that really reflects simply one setting for a different dimension. The the, the, the second way of looking at the world, the second dimension in terms of understanding social action, which separates the Pope as different from both the communists and the capitalists, is the communists and capitalists actually share something in common. They share an anthropological outlook, a definition or a, a concept of what it is to be human, which is the same, but very different to the Christian view. This is really, really important. The Christian view is totally different to both the left and the right. The left and the right's anthropology is Siamese twins. So we have a second dimension. We're going to call this second dimension, I'm going to call it the anthropological dimension. And largely um, JP2 was very big on making this notion of anthropology, the importance of anthropology, really, really important in a lot of his writings. And he said you can't solve any of the social problems unless you get the anthropology right. Now this is really what we've been talking about all night. One particular view of anthropology gives you left and right, but unfortunately that's a very limited form of anthropology. You need a different view of the human person. The view of the human person that dominates in the West is the material individualist. There is another, well it might be a number of alternatives, but I'm going to say that the major alternative is the soldierist. That's the word I'm going to use, so it's a bit awkward, a bit like distributist or something, but you know, it does the job. I would suggest that there have been a number of solidarist cultures in history, and at present, solidarism was promoted and lived in the Catholic Church as the major element that really distinguished itself socially from the rest of the West. And as the Protestants and the atheists and all the other ists that have fallen away from Christianity over the last half millennia or so have, have done stuff. What they've done is come away from solidarism, an idea of seeing other humans as brothers, into the material individualist, either left or right. As well as Christians, we also find the ancients, and we saw that in the first evening, I think, and we have uh, the indigenous people, all solidaristic cultures. They all live in anthropology, which has a lot in common. So I'd say that Christianity actually has a lot more in common with Highlander New Guineans, who have maybe never seen Christianity, than true Christianity has with individualist people who might call them Christians. Might call themselves Protestants or something. Okay, this is the second dimension. I'll put a third dimension in here, 
The third dimension goes deeper, it goes down to that metaphysics dimension that we're talking about in the hierarchy. Third dimension, the, the theological dimension. What kind of a deity you have? Because what I suggest is that while we're talking about the Christian God, the Trinity, versus uh, atheism, which is largely what we're seeing in our world, there are other possibilities. To a certain extent, we see it with Christianity versus uh, Islam. There are, there are more than one deity that you can adore. There's Zoroastrians and, and um, you know, whatever it is that the uh, voodoo people kind of worship and all of the other people that used to go along to the World Day of Peace. Uh, there are many, many different forms, di different, different gods. I'm going to turn the hierarchy onto its side here. I'm going to suggest that from your spiritual setting, you end up with an anthropology and also it's in a culture and from this it gives you the apparent kind of society. Right? And I'm just going to look at how this gives rise to that and just look at some possibilities now. I'm going to suggest that to begin with we can have either a positive deity or a negative deity like um, Kali or uh, some, what was the uh, what was the thing that they worshipped in, in, in Carthage? Like Baal or uh, right. so, some evil thing that relies on, on a different dynamic to get people to, to follow itself. And in the middle you've got the, the atheist or perhaps the agnostic. And that gives rise to an anthropology. So you've got three possibilities on the left in the green. You're going to give rise to an anthropology. Let's look at the anthropology that comes from a positive gaiety. We, we see it best in, in Christianity, but I think you could probably show this to a Muslim and they would probably see similar things here, I suspect. I, I, people are made by God and relate to him. And this is something that you find with a lot of indigenous cultures, this idea that their customs and traditions, their property rights and all sorts of things, all come as a result of a relationship with God. It engenders respect, honesty and charity, especially in the Christian tradition. And I would say go one step further because I tend to think that the Christian religion is the only religion that understands God as he really is. The atheist gives rise to the view of every man for himself, every person for themselves. And so from that comes individualism, materialism, and the idea, and this is one of the really trick things I find when I'm teaching professional ethics, right? that honesty pays, but so does dishonesty. You know, how do I get somebody who's going to go out and become a, a property economist or what have you to be really honest by teaching them about professional ethics when I know and they know that if you're slick at being dishonest in the property game, you can make an awful lot more money than being honest. There's got to be something else going on. Right? And the atheist is able to work on that. No, that's a fact. Right? I try and do it with Aristotle, but anyway. Third possibility, negative deity. The other is for exploitation. You see that with Kali worship, from what I understand of voodoo your, and black magic. There are places where the negative deity is force, is power, is will against will, is conflict. It's overcoming the, the opposition. If you don't have to go too far into the occult and black magic, you know, what do witches do and, and people like that when they call up demons? They want to call up a demon which they think they're going to be able to master with their will in order to get the demon to do their work. It's scary, horrible stuff. But basically, it's a relationship in terms of exploitation. Right? And if I'm going to conjure up a spirit as a doing black magic, I do it because I want it to be my slave. Of course, it's going to be my slave, but oh no, I'm going to be its slave. But you know, you like to think otherwise. Right? This idea of the relationship is all in terms of slavery, and exploitation. Gives you the creeps just thinking about it. But it's real, and it's a something which is very powerful in the world, has been over time. Okay, but what does the culture, how we go back to the positive deity, is a little bit of good news. We see it in enduring customary peoples, community property, we see cultural growth, we see peace, we see civilization, we see the flourishing of the liberal arts, poetry, science, when your culture is based ultimately on a positive deity. In the middle, we see basically, I think the best historical example is Lake Rome, and uh, today the excesses and ugliness of both socialism and capitalism from the atheistic approach, and from a negative deity, the Aztecs, 
Fagis, and Kali worship, and Carthage. So they're kind of the possibilities. Right? So these are the dynamics. This is what can run our culture. Now, in a certain extent, our world is in here. It's Christianity versus the atheist self, right? We tend not to think about that. Maybe we do it in our R-rated horror movies, right? Sort of creepy things with power at night, you know, your zombie, whatever it is. But we don't take it too seriously, right? But it is a serious thing, and it's, it's, I mean, the devil's real. Okay, I'll take this just a little tiny bit further, we're going to finish now. Okay, what have we got? I think the ultimate negative deity is avarice. Avarice, the love of money, works as a god. It seems to have the capacity to do all the things that a god should do. And another time I'll be arguing that I suspect that avarice will be, or is, the sin at the end of history. And if you think about it, avarice causes one to think of the other as being for uh, exploitation. It's why we have an abortion industry. Planned Parenthood might be above some deep philosophical hatred of humanity, but they're also about making an awful lot of money. And you find that so much of what is peddled in order to make money is done on the back of really demeaning the, the drug industry and so on. It's really a form of what we're describing here as a negative deity. But all of the ugliness has got the dynamic of a religion, avarice. And if you go through the Gospels again, you find over and over again the alternative to Christianity that our Lord was preaching, the, the thing that you had to be away that turned your back on was avarice. The Jews who loved money were the enemy. The, the, the rich man. This, this love of money is this corrupting influence. And the early church was very much aware of it. You had to turn your back on avarice in order to follow Christ. It's in the end of history. When the Son of Man comes, will he find any faith on, on earth? I'll just wind down with this idea. The positive deity is, of course, Christ, the Blessed Trinity. And one way or another, any society which is not based on that Trinitarian model and the reality, which is at the very foundation of everything that is, cannot last. And so we can't have a society that ignores the reality of what it's actually based on. Final thing I'd just like to put up for your reflection is that some years ago, a father, Joseph Ratzinger, wrote a book on the theology of history according to St. Bonaventure. And in it, one of the observations he made was his agreement with a long-standing tradition that Franciscan spirituality will be the order, like the religious order, the rule, if you like, at the end of history. What is distinctive about Franciscan spirituality? The love of poverty. What is that need of the church for the spirit of poverty, the Franciscan spirit? What is the enemy going to be? The enemy is going to be the antithesis of the Franciscan love of poverty. And one way or another, it's what is going to completely undo in our creation and give rise to our Lord and when he comes again saying will he find any faith on earth okay that's about as much as we can do for an evening